Well, hello and welcome to Musings of a Texas Preacher Man. I'm Scott Fisher and I'm glad you've chosen to study with me today. We're studying the Great Persecution, looking at the New Testament text, discussing the persecution and crucifixion of Jesus and the subsequent persecution and murder of his first followers. The irony of it all is that Jesus and his first followers, including all of the apostles, were Jewish and their persecutors were Jewish. In spite of what the text actually says, many evangelical Christians, Messianic Jews, and non-Messianic Jews claim that the persecution of Jesus and his followers was not at the hands of the first century Jewish leaders. In fact, they say that to claim that the Jews were responsible for it has opened the door to Christian persecution of Jews over the past 2,000 years. So what does the text actually say? Is it reliable? And is there any justification for Christian persecution of Jews? If you haven't watched the first two videos in this series, I, I really encourage you to do so because we really lay the foundation for where we're going. Matthew opens his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus. Now, why is that important? Because one of the major tenets of Judaism was direct bloodline through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Also, the Messianic prophecies declared that Messiah would come through the bloodline of King David, the royal bloodline through the tribe of Judah. Now, this prophetic distinction goes all the way back to Genesis 49 and Jacob, or Israel's, blessing of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. And then the Lord told King David that he would, quote, not lack a man on the throne of Israel. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Lord declares to David through the prophet Nathan, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant or seed after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now most interpret this passage to be speaking of Solomon. I believe it's speaking of Jesus. It's Jesus who would sit on the throne of David forever. It's Jesus who is building a house, the dwelling place of God, the messianic temple. Solomon was apostate, and the kingdom was divided following his death and was ultimately destroyed. So Matthew then identifies Jesus as coming through the bloodline of David. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Matthew writes, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Jesus came at the prophesied appointed time. Now, when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary to announce that she had, quote, found favor with God and would give birth to the Son of the Most High, here's what else he said to her. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Bloodline. In Luke 3, Luke records the genealogy of Jesus through his father Joseph, back through King David, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, and all the way back to Adam. Messiah had to meet the bloodline requirement in addition to fulfilling all the other prophecies concerning the coming Messiah. Now we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, another prophetic fulfillment because 
Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem for the census that was required by decree from Caesar Augustus. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details surrounding this, but if you're interested, there's a fascinating book by a man named Ernest L. Martin, and the book is entitled The Birth of Christ Recalculated. Now, it's out of print, it's difficult to find, and it is quite expensive when it is found, but it is worth the read. But Martin provides a historical review to determine the timeline of the events surrounding the birth of Jesus and the star of Bethlehem. In that book, he chronicles the historical record. Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem for what is called a census because they were of the royal bloodline of David. So they had to go to Bethlehem, the home of the royals. The purpose of this census was that 2 BC would be the 750th anniversary of Rome and the 25th anniversary of Caesar Augustus's reign. And the census was an empire-wide requirement that all of the Roman Empire was to record their support of Caesar. They would go in and sign a document that they support Augustus Caesar. Martin puts the actual birth of Jesus at September the 11th of 3 BC when they would have been in Bethlehem for that census. It's Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and there's all kinds of prophetic significance to that. Now from Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph return home in Nazareth following their stop at the temple in Jerusalem for the dedication of Jesus and for his circumcision. At some later point, somewhere around a year later, they actually move into a house in Bethlehem, and that's where they are when the Magi from the east come. Matthew records the visit of the Magi who had, quote, followed his star. They come to Jerusalem and meet with King Herod and ask, where is it that this king of the Jews had been born? Well, the question jars Herod. He gathers the chief priests and the scribes and asks about where the prophet said that the Messiah was to be born, and they tell Herod in Bethlehem. Matthew tells us that Herod is enraged when he realizes the Magi had not come back and revealed to him who this child is. Now, we pick up the story in Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, where Matthew writes, After hearing the king... They, the Magi, went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, now that's significant because Jesus was born in a manger. There was no room for them in the inn, but now they're in Bethlehem, and they are living in a house. And the Magi come to this house, and they see the child with Mary his mother, and they fall to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. And this brings us to that very first persecution that would come against Jesus. An angel appears to Joseph in a dream and warns him that, quote, Herod is going to search for the child in order to destroy him. So Mary and Joseph and Jesus flee to Egypt. And in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, we read, then Her when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Now, in Herod's mind, if there really was the birth of Messiah, it would be the end of his kingdom, the end of his power. 
he had to get rid of this perceived threat to his throne. The murder of every male child in the region of Bethlehem, two years of age and under, would solve Herod's problem, or so he thought. Following the death of Herod in January of 1 BC, an angel of the Lord appears once again to Joseph in a dream and lets him know that they could return to Israel for, quote, those who sought the child's life are dead. And Joseph takes the family back to Nazareth. The great persecution had begun. The great persecution was an attempt to destroy Messiah. And it comes first through Herod. And then we'll continue over the next few weeks as we look further into this great persecution. I hope you'll continue to join me right here as we continue this series on the attempt to distort and destroy the teaching of Jesus and his first century followers. I call it the Great Persecution, and you'll find it right here on Musings of a Texas Preacher Man. I'll be posting a teaching four times each week on Monday through Thursday. I'll post a link on Facebook and Twitter, and if you click the subscribe button in the lower right corner of your screen, you'll be notified whenever I post a new video. Now remember, let Scripture interpret Scripture. And if you like these videos, I hope you'll click the like button and even share it with your friends on social media. Well, I hope you'll go out and make today a great day. Be safe, be blessed, and I'll hope to see you right here again tomorrow.